This evening <laughs> to our Christmas Eve service. It's wonderful to see you all here. Please continue to worship.
seated. Well, at this time, we're going to um, do our Advent wreath, and I'm going to invite up the Cereal family. I'll let you go ahead and introduce your tribe. <laughs> um, I'm Erica. This is Alan, Heather, Daisy, Josh, Jasmine, and AJ. Perfect. And can you tell me how long have all of you been coming to Waypoint? Seven years. And can you give me a couple of ways, and I know you guys are very active and serving in our church. Can you give me a couple of ways in which you guys serve here? Um, I work in the youth group. He works with the kids area, mm -hmm. and um, Jasmine, Daisy, and Heather work in the kids area, but Jasmine more focuses on um, nursery and preschool. That's awesome. Well, you guys have, are going to be reviewing for us all the, the ways that we've lit the candles over the, the whole Advent season, so I'll let you guys go ahead and get started. The first candle of Advent, we recall the hope we have in Christ. We light this candle to remind us to be alert and watch for his return. The second candle of Advent is the candle of peace. We light this candle to remind us that he brings peace to all who trust in him. The third candle of Advent is called the candle of joy. We light it to remember that he is the bringer of true and everlasting joy. The fourth candle of Advent is the candle of love. We light this candle to remind us of how God's perfect love is found in Jesus. The white candle represents the Christ candle. We light the Christ candle to remind us that the light of the world was born this night. The people who walked in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has been shown. You, O Lord, have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his sh shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is also called Emmanuel, for in him God is with us. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so very much. And God, we thank you for this season. God, we thank you for the reminder that it is of how you pursued us some 2,000 years ago by sending your only son. And through Jesus, we have hope and joy and love and peace and a future. And so God, we rejoice in you. We love you. And God, we thank you for your presence here. And so Lord, for, for each person here, I pray that you would meet us where we're at, that you would help us in whatever our context, whatever our situation is, but help us to know that we can have hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray all of this. Amen. 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 Hey, I want to welcome you to, to Waypoint Church. It is so great to be together on this Christmas Eve. I want to let you know we're not taking a, an offering by passing offering plates, but rather we're doing it this way. We've got boxes by the door, and throughout the year, I, I want you to know that we are a church that seeks to be a, a generously giving church, that, that we you know, take 10% of anything that we take in, and we give that to missions or work in the community, and, and we, we give that away, and we seek to model that. So tonight, every offering that's taken in tonight is going to go to our Compassionate Care Fund. And this great fund exists to help people in crisis here in this community. So if you wanted to, to, to give a check or donation, just please do that as you exit. You can make it out to Waypoint Church. But again, everything that we take in tonight, we're giving uh, to this Compassionate Care Fund for the purpose of helping people in crisis. So hey, um, I have an opportunity, and I want to, uh, we're going to have a kids moment here. So if there, 
if there's children here in, in, in this uh, spot, I invite them to come on up here. I've got, we're going to, basically anybody who wants a candy cane, come on up here. Uh, probably ought to have an age range on that, but, uh, but hey, <laughs> yeah, you guys come on up here. If it's okay, hey guys, I'm going to sit right here and I've got a, yeah, there we go. Yeah, you guys grab a seat. Hey, get comfy, and I uh, want to say Merry Christmas to you guys. Everybody, yeah. Merry, Merry Christmas to you guys. Okay, can, hey, main thing is, oh, and in and, uh, and just a little bit, okay? Can you guys get to a spot where you can see this candy cane right here? So I'm going to hold this, and I invite you, you guys can sit up here, you guys can sit where you guys are mm -hmm. at, but I want you to take a look at this candy cane, okay? We're going to talk about this. And so, so the thing I wanted to share with you guys, just really quick, by the way, Merry Christmas. This is such an exciting time, isn't it? <laughs> hey, um... We're going to talk about symbols, and there's lots of symbols in our lives, and I'll, I'll tell you, there's, there's symbols all around us. Um, I wear a symbol on my finger. It's my wedding ring, and it's a symbol of my marriage covenant with my wife. Um, I, I look back, there's a cross back there. There's symbols, uh, you know, with that, and we remember what Jesus did for us. So I, I learned recently that there's a legend that the candy cane is a symbol for us as well. And so there's a few things that I want to ask you guys and highlight to you guys about the candy cane, okay? So first, it's, it's shaped like a shepherd's staff. And we remember that God gave the shepherds an invitation to celebrate Jesus. And they came in and they worshiped Jesus. They got to see him like right when he was born. And so that's a reminder for us in that. Um, Candy cane is a very uh, hard candy, right? You can't mush it, right? And it's a reminder to us that Jesus is our rock, and we can trust in him, and he is solid. Uh, the main color of the candy cane is what? Somebody raise your hand and tell me. Some, somebody, uh, okay, go ahead, Asher. Yeah, uh, red is one of the main colors. Very, very good. And so we see that, and remember, you know, Jesus hurt for us. He suffered for us. And he even bled for, for you and for me. And he did that because he loves us. The red is a reminder for us in that. And what other color do you see? White. white. And white is a reminder of his purity. That he lived life without any sin. And we rejoice in him in that. And one last reminder I want to share with you guys. And then uh, you guys each get a candy cane. But if I, if I turn this this way... Let me make sure I get it uh, uh, facing the correct way. <laughs> yeah, it's J, right? And of course, J is the first letter of Jesus' name. So, hey, uh, as you guys eat and enjoy a candy cane sometime when your parents let you, uh, you guys enjoy that. But remember that Jesus loves you and that he came as a baby in a manger to pursue you. So, hey, can everybody snag one candy cane and you guys can head back to your seats, okay? No, no, I'll grab yeah. Thank take you. take one. Thank yeah, there you guys no, go. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. I'll take the whole basket. Thanks, Sam.
you express your appreciation to this uh, team? <laughs> Amen. And what a great song to celebrate Christmas. What a great song to celebrate this baby who was born to us some 2,000 years ago. What a great uh, opportunity for us to come together and sing these, these wonderful songs and, and to celebrate and to make all this fuss about a baby born in a manger. But it begs the question, if we take a step backwards and, and wonder out loud, you know, why? Why is it so important to us that this baby was born in this way? Why is it so important and, and to be celebrated on the highest level that a child is born in Bethlehem under these circumstances? Why? Because if you're anything like me, I, I take a look at my life and I, I consider, I've got, I've, I've got problems, you've got problems, we've all got problems, you know, and things that I need to work through, whether it be in my family, in my job, in, in my life, and, and health, and, and situation, and I take a look at those, and I, how can a baby born in a manger make a difference in my situation today? And I'm here to tell you that that baby born in a manger in those circumstances that we just sang about, that we just, uh, that we're reflecting on, makes all the difference in the world because he provides us hope and opportunity and a future. So we're on this series. We've been in this series this month called The Thrill of Hope. And we've taken a look at different aspects, different characters that have benefited from Jesus and the hope that he provides. And so, so uh, we, we've talked about this for, for several weeks now. And I invite you, if, if you want to check out more of the series, check out our website. We have, uh, we have those sermons recorded, those uh, uh, services recorded. We, check those out. But we did talk about a guy by the name of Jairus and his need for hope because his daughter was dying. So he pursued Jesus and he begged Jesus, would you please come because I know that there's hope in you. I know you could save my daughter. And even while Jesus was coming, people approached him and said, you know what? You, there's no hope anymore. Your, your daughter just passed away. Why bother Jesus? There's no hope in the situation. And Jesus spoke to Jairus and he said, he said these words. He said, do not fear, only believe. And, and very clearly, don't worry about what the world is telling you. Just believe, because with me there's hope. That, that was Jesus' words. Uh, further, we, the next week, we talked about John the Baptist and this, this uh, person who was, who was uh, to prepare the way for Jesus and who, who uh, spoke messages and who himself was very well known in, in the area and beyond. People came from all over to hear John the Baptist. But he himself knew that true hope couldn't exist if people put their hope in another human being. But they had to put their hope in Jesus, in God in flesh. So John the Baptist, even though he was a celebrity of his time, well-known, well-revered, people all over knew him, but he kept pointing to Jesus. So much so, people observed what was happening. And they, they said, John the Baptist, you realize what's happening? People aren't listening to you anymore, and instead they're going to Jesus. People are leaving you. You are losing influence. You're losing uh, uh, celebrity. You're losing uh, all these things, your fame. You're losing all of this to Jesus. And John the Baptist, knowing, again, that true hope only comes from Jesus, said, it's not about me. And he said this great phrase. He said, he, Jesus, he must increase I must decrease. True hope is found in Jesus. And then we talked about the shepherds and their journey and this amazing uh, night that they had that first Christmas day where they're out in the fields with their flocks and they're hanging out just like they do every day watching sheep. But all of a sudden, an, uh, an angel appears to them and invites them to go and visit, to come see what God is doing, how this child is born on this day. And they were invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and, and we talk about this and this invitation that we all have to take part in this greatest story ever. And that is God's great rescue plan for all of us. And then yesterday, we, just, we talked about this, this concept that we all need hope 
that if we understand our situation, our situation is not a good one. Our situation is, is more similar to a ship that is sinking than to a, an island in paradise as we live our lives. It's more similar to a plane that's crashing or a house that's burning that we got to get out of. Something has to happen. We are in crisis in our situation. And, and, and we talked about how the wages of sin is death. The earnings that we have because we sinned and because Adam and Eve sinned and every human being has sinned and gone our own way. Our situation is not good. We need a savior. We need hope. And Jesus fulfills it. So this is part of God's great rescue plan. Why a baby in a manger? Why, why did, did we need a Messiah? It was because in the beginning, God created us to be in a relationship with him. And that we're, we're meant to be in fellowship with God. And God walked with Adam and Eve. And God talked with Adam and Eve. And they enjoyed perfect fellowship and this is God's intent for humankind. But because of our own sin, we broke that. And a holy God can't dwell with an unholy people unless something happens. This is our crisis. This is our spot. But God's great rescue plan included sending prophets and foreshadowing speaking prophecy, here's how God would rescue humankind. And he wouldn't just snap his fingers, but he would give sacrificially. He would send his only son. He would provide evidence for this. And we talked yesterday about a lot of prophecy that, that God foretold, even the, the, the town that Jesus would be born in. And, and, and what we celebrate at Christmas is fulfillment of prophecy through Jesus Christ. And Jesus lived that perfect life that none of us could, and he died on a cross as a criminal, even though he was innocent in every way. And then he rose from the grave. And whoever trusts in him has relationship restored, has eternal life. And then when we pass from this life to the next, we get to have that fellowship that God created us to be with in him. And so this is what we celebrate. And, and Romans 8 uh, speaks of this and speaks of our condition, and speaks of what God is doing for us. Romans 8, 22. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers, we also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies that he has promised for us. So Paul is writing about this. He's writing about our situation. He's writing about this burning building that we're in. He, he's writing about this, this plane that's going down and how Jesus has saved us when we trust in him. And so he gives the analogy. He says, all creation is groaning kind of like childbirth. Okay, and, and uh, quick disclaimer, I've never given birth, okay? But I've heard it's really, really painful, okay? And so he uses this analogy, though, and I think he chooses this very intentionally and in saying, listen, it, like, like in childbirth, like that, that woman who has to carry this child for nine months and, and all the things that come with that and then labor pains and then delivery, all that is absolutely painful and, and, and you, you just can't wait for it to end. But the key part of this analogy is it does end and then with that comes new life. And Paul's speaking and saying, all creation is yearning for this new life, for relationship to be restored in the same way. Verse 24, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. That is fully restored relationship. That is to realize that there's more to this life than just paying our bills and hitting the alarm clock every morning. But we have a purpose and, and we can live this out. We can engage with God's love. And then when we get our new body, when we pass from this life, we have relationship restored. And all that comes from Jesus. 
Romans 6.23 captures this so well, and it says, for the wages of sin is death. Again, the earnings that we have because of our sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And I want to share with you uh, this verse in, in Matthew 19. And this is so important uh, for me because of my situation, because of your situation, because of all, everyone. We need God to step in. But our problems are complex. And, and taking a look at any of our lives, we, we have struggles and we, we have uh, grief, we have troubles, we have you know, things where we say, I don't know how this is going to resolve. I don't know what good can come of this. I don't know how God can work in this situation. And I want to share with you this verse in Matthew 19, even as the disciples were wondering uh, something similar. Can there be hope? Jesus, based on what you just taught us, who could possibly be saved? So, so this is the conversation. When the disciples heard this conversation, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can possibly be saved? Who could be saved, Jesus? Jesus. Based on what you've shared, we're not seeing a lot of hope. We're, we're struggling in this, and we need to know how good can come of this. And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. If we try to figure out purpose in life on our own, if we try to, you know, whether it's our own fame or fortune or abilities or whatever triumphs we might have in this life, if we try to do it on our own and find purpose and fulfillment, we will fail. But when we trust in Jesus, when we trust in God's great rescue plan, that he would send a baby to us 2,000 years ago to carry out this plan, to live that perfect life so that whoever trusts in him would have eternal life, would have their sins forgiven and washed away in a way that we never could on our own. And God did this by sending his only son to us in one solitary life. I want to finish by sharing with you this, uh, this poem that I, I absolutely love. And it's written about Jesus. And it, and it says this, that he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman, he grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. For three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or a home. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments, the only property that he had on earth. And when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. About 19, 20 centuries have come and gone. And today, he is the central figure of the human race. And all the armies that have ever marched and all the navies that have ever sailed, and all the parliaments and governments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man and woman on this earth as much as this one solitary life. And Jesus came, and this is what we celebrate at Christmas. Him carrying out this perfect rescue plan. And we all have an invitation to take part in it. So may God bless you as you pursue God who has already been pursuing you. Let me pray for us and we'll close through song and candle lighting. Let's pray. God, we love you. And God, we thank you for Jesus and for what he means to us. God, thank you for your great rescue plan. The fact that you saw our need 
God, that you know our situation. And God, you care. And you send us the Redeemer, the Messiah, the Savior. And so God, we respond to you in love and joy and adoration and worship. We thank you so much for this invitation into fellowship with you. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. from him.